While preparing a tutorial about a slice light developed for this Spider-Verse like demo, after transforming this other one into a full cross-hatching post-process material, I realized this dotted gradient would have been the perfect starting point for another full-fledged art style. Nowadays, these dots have become a core stylistic component of every image that wants to feel comic-y. Truth is, though, they were just a print artifact, created by the less mature printing technology of the time, along with the fact that the comic production houses wanted to keep costs down, further reducing the quality. If you ever looked at a print up close, you know what I'm talking about. These dots exist simply because that's how printers lay out ink on paper. Alright, in this video we're gonna see how to simulate this print effect by going through a series of steps. The creation of a grid of dots of varying size, laid out so that they reproduce an image. The conversion of an RGB image to a 4-color process 1 and back, so that we have ink data available to generate our image. The reproduction of the offset print technology pattern through the layout of multiple grids. And, at the end, we'll implement some mind-bending tech to transform what we did into an artistic tool we can use to generate images never seen before. Let's create a new post-process material and let's start. First things first, we need a grid of dots. Let's take the screen UV coordinates and let's multiply them by the number of cells we want our grid to have. Let's remove the fractional part from these values and let's add 0.5. The values we have now represent the location of each grid cell center, which will correspond to the location of each of our dots. So, now we can calculate the distance between our scaled screen UVs and these locations to obtain the dot distance fields. Looks like the grid cells are not squares though, and they change their aspect ratio accordingly to the viewport shape. To fix that, we must calculate the viewport's aspect ratio and use it to correct the deformation of our starting UVs. We start by grabbing the view size and separating its components. Now, since we just want to scale the grid on the horizontal axis to make it composed of only squares, we divide x by y. This is the scale factor of the U of our UVs, to fix the aspect ratio. Let's append to it a 1 for the V, since we want them to remain unchanged and save the result to a named root node. Now let's multiply the UVs by these values before doing anything else. And there we go, now we'll always have the set number of cells on the vertical axis, and horizontally the shader will adjust automatically to fill the screen with squares. Now, let's transform these distance fields in dots. To do that, we can set a dot size value and subtract it from the distance field. Now we have negative values where the dot is present, and positive values where it is not. To better visualize it, let's increase by a lot the gradient contrast by dividing it by a very small number, and let's clamp the result between 0 and 1 to obtain our final mask. Let's play a bit with our dot size value and let's see how it behaves. Hmm, looks like the dots are able to entirely fill the cells at about 0.7 size, but we want them to be normalized and do that when set to a size of 1. What we know is that the cell has width and height of 1, and the dot is at its center, which, relatively to it, is the position 0.5, 0.5. It means that the dot reaches the cell side with a size of 0.5, and its corner at around 0.7, or, to be precise, 0.5 times the square root of 2. So, if we want to normalize it so that with a size of 1 the dot exactly touches the cell corner, we have to divide it by half the square root of 2. Or even better, after running some math, we simply multiply it by the square root of 2. Cool, how do we transform this into an image then? At the moment, we are just setting all the dot sizes uniformly through this parameter. What happens if we use a non-uniform value like a gradient? Let's try with one of the UV channels. There you go, we get progressively bigger dots depending on the input value in that specific screen area. Well, what happens if we pass a scale parameter the image that is being rendered in the viewport then? Let's add a syntax or node set to post-process input 0 and let's desaturate and clamp it. 
Well, that's something that vaguely resembles an image. Let's increase the grid resolution. Uh, that's better, even though the output is inverted. Let's fix it. Alright, we finally have something presentable, even though we need to take a step back and lower the resolution again. Why do our dots get these weird shapes? That's because the resolution of the image we're using as input doesn't match the grid resolution, so different parts of the same cell distance field are being scaled differently. To avoid that, we need to virtually downscale the rendered image so that it matches the grid. To achieve that, we can recycle the UVs we manipulated to generate the grid and use them as UV input for the scene texture node, but only after reverting all the transformations we applied to them. As you can see, we successfully managed to pixelate the image to the same size of the grid. Let's now have a look at our dots. Now all of them are perfectly round, even though some of them, the bigger ones, are getting cut out on the sides. This happens because the dots get bigger than the cell containing them, and at the moment each cell can only draw the dot it contains. It has no visibility on what's happening nearby. The only way to fix it is to repeat the generation of the grid four more times, once for each neighbor, and pass through each time a different neighbor cell position. Let's rearrange some of the things first to not make this operation become a nightmare. Let's save as named the root node the scaled UVs, so we can now detach the UV processing nodes from the dot generating ones. At this point we can simply duplicate this bunch of nodes four more times. Now, in each one of these copies we need to evaluate a different neighbor cell position, which we can do by adding an offset to the cell chord value. Final step is to now combine all these dot sections together by taking the mean value of all of them. And there you go, now all of our dots have the proper shape. We finally got a solid base to reproduce the print effect we're looking for. Let's now see how we can convert our RGB image into quantities of printing inks. If you ever saw a printer in your life, you probably already know that normally the used inks are four, cyan, magenta, yellow and black. And that's actually from where the acronym comes from, C, M, Y, K. And no, the K is because the black used is a specific one, which is called Key Black. Anyways, this is a very different color system from the one we use to display images on screen, not only because of the different colors we use, but also because RGB starts from a black base and adds light to reach white, while CMYK starts from a white base and subtracts light to reach black. Alright, let's make a new material function that will contain the RGB to CMYK conversion, since we'll need it quite a lot of times. The operation is actually pretty simple. Let's first ensure our input is in 0-1 range with a saturate node, and then let's 1- minus it. This will give us for each channel the cyan, magenta and yellow ink amounts. And it makes sense if you think about it. If we invert any of the RGB primary colors, we get exactly the primary CMY ones. Technically, with just these three inks we can already reproduce a complete image, since by laying them out on the same spot we would obtain black anyways. This is sometimes done in real life too, to either bring printing costs down by removing a whole ink puzzle together, or to make space for some brand identity Pantone color, but we won't care about that now. At the moment, we are aiming to reproduce a CMYK print. To calculate the amount of black ink, we need to first calculate the luminance of the image by taking the max value among the RGB channels and then invert it. Let's now append this value into a full vector 4 and hook it up to the output. Oh, there's one more thing we can account for to have a better quality image at the end. At the moment, in black areas of the image, we have all inks overlapping on the same spot. While this is not a bad thing by itself, since the result will be black anyways, it can create some disturbing artifacts on the edges. We can avoid that by removing CMY inks from areas where the black ink is above an arbitrary threshold. To do that, we create a parameter for such threshold and we subtract from it the black ink map, so that now the only positive values are places where we have lots of that ink. 
To transform these values into a binary mask, we can calculate the sign of it and clamp the negative values to zero. And finally, multiply the CMY ink maps by this mask. Nice, we finally have our ink maps and we'll be able to use them to generate our dots, but we still need to visualize the final result on an RGB screen. That means we need a way to transform our CMYK colors back to RGB. That will be useful to check if we did any errors in our first conversion too, because if we don't get back exactly the same image we started from after going to CMYK and back, it means that we did something wrong. This is a super simple conversion too. We calculate the max between the C and Y vector and K and we invert the result. Let's quickly check if our color system transformations properly work. Since we don't see any difference between the starting image and the reconverted one, I'd say we got it right. Let's implement this color conversion in our dot grid, in replacement of the desaturation we initially added. And let's also add a channel mask to isolate the ink we want to create the grid for. We're finally ready to recreate this print pattern, but first we must understand from where it comes from. It is effectively the layout that minimizes how much the inks interfere with each other, so that the different colors overlap as little as possible. To achieve that, the grid of each of those inks are rotated at precise angles. 15 degrees for cyan, 75 for magenta, 0 for yellow and 45 degrees for black. And these rotations are what gives birth to the typical print pattern. So we now know what to do then, we need to be able to rotate our grids. We can add a rotator node right before flooring our UBs, setting it up like this so we can input the rotation in degrees at the time input pin. Let's save the rotation angle to an emery root node. And let's use it again to rotate back the UVs before using them. Remember, we need to revert back all the transformations we apply to the UVs after processing them before usage. Cool, now our grid of dots can be freely rotated around. Next step is to combine together four differently rotated grids with the different key colors. To keep things tidy, let's move this whole thing into a material function and let's transform the grid resolution and the angle of rotation into function inputs. Moreover, we need a system to set, from outside the function, which ink we want to isolate. We can't change the channel mask from outside or set different values to them in different instances of the material function. Well, that's another handy use for the dot product. If we dot the ink masks vector 4 with another vector 4 that has only zeros aside from a single component set to 1, it works exactly as a channel mask. And now we can convert this vector 4 into a function input so that we can dynamically mask different channels from outside. One last thing to do is to invert the final result to properly match the output values with what we want, maps that represent ink amounts, so the dots must be white and the clean paper must be black. Now we can finally move back to our shader and call our material function 4 times. We can set one resolution value for all of them, add the proper rotation angles and mask the correct ink channels. Then we combine them all into a vector 4 and we reconvert everything from CMYK to RGB. And finally, our filter is done and ready to use. And moreover, as usual, if we are trying to obtain a stylized image, we can always pair it with a nice outline filter like the one I did in this other video. Go check it out. And, so that you know, you can download a sample project with this print filter by following the link in the description, but wait, it's not over yet. As promised, now it's time to go wild. We reproduce the effect we wanted, we now understand it and we have control over its tech. It's time to put our creativity at work and use it as a tool to achieve a new artistic result. The idea for what I'm about to show you came to me while working on this video and noticing that if we reduce the resolution of the print enough, we could interpret the result as a sort of stylized blur. If we were able to reduce the resolution of the grid unevenly across the image, we could be able to create a sort of stylized version of effects like vignette, depth of field and fog of war, for example. Problem is that if we just use a gradient to manipulate the resolution, we get a trippy result. Not necessarily horrible, but definitely not what we want.
we could try to quantize the gradient in a small number of steps to give some space between each resolution transition. That's closer, but still, we have some very clear banding going on, which is quite disturbing and can't be mitigated by increasing the number of bands. Ah, oh, if we only had a smooth way of transitioning from one resolution to another. Hmm, what if... let's see... We animate the dots in such a way that, in groups of four, they merge into one bigger dot? This sounds like a plan, quite an hard one to execute, but a plan nonetheless. Let's break it down in little steps and let's try to figure it out. Let's rebuild separately the grid of dots in its simplest form. We're now looking for a way to move each one of these dots towards a shared corner among their cells, in two by two groups. We can observe that the desired direction of movement repeats every other cell on both axes. So we can say that all dots at even indices should increase their position components and all of them at odd indices should decrease it. Ok, let's start from the cell's positions right after the floor node and let's make some space. First thing to do is to identify which cells are in even positions and which are in odd positions. Let's start by removing the sign so we deal only with positive values. Now, to see if an integer number is even or odd, we can calculate its remainder when divided by 2. The division will have a remainder of 0 if the number is even and 1 if it's odd. This is valid for both x and y axes, so what we got here is a grid of pairs that say if the cell is even along x and or along y. We can treat this as a sort of ID map that tells us which direction the corresponding dot should move. Instead of implementing it this way though, we could be smart about it and convert these zeros and ones directly in the offset vectors we need. Let's picture these pairs of values as 2D vectors. If we now subtract 0.5 from both components, we get this which is exactly the opposite of what we need. So, last thing to do is to multiply by minus 1 to invert the signs. And there you go, we have our offsets. What's cool about that is that we don't even need to normalize and rescale them, because they already are of the precise length we need. And now, as you can see, we have a grid of dots that is exactly half the resolution we set. Not because its resolution is actually half, but because the dots converge in the proper cell's corners. We can visualize it better by animating the offset. That's cool, isn't it? Now we got few things to address though. First one is that our converged dots are not correctly normalized anymore. If we do a comparison of this grid with one that has no offsets but has that resolution natively, we can clearly see that the gradients are off. This happens because the real resolution of the grid hasn't changed, we are just creating the illusion of a grid with half the number of cells per side. So the distance that the distance field should be normalized over is not anymore from the center of the cell to its corner, but from a corner to the opposite one, twice as much, basically. Well, we can simply fix it by halvening the factor of normalization. Problem is that now we only need it for the unoffsetted state. So we must animate this value too. Alright, we know that it has to go from square root of 2 when the animation value is at 0 to half square root of 2 when the animation value is at 1. So we can invert the animation value, multiply it by half square root of 2 and then add another half square root of 2. And now the distance fields scale in proportion to their offsets correctly during the animation. Second thing to address is the fact that at the moment we can only reduce the grid resolution in half once and that's it, which is definitely not enough for the type of stylized blurring we want to achieve. I mean, imagine it while using a very high resolution, we don't get much by just halvening it. So, first thing we need is a series of numbers that we can procedurally generate for our progressive resolutions. At each step, the grid has to double in size... Ah, a bit like texture map maps do. You know, to have a series of numbers that double at each step, you can start from any number and multiply it by 2 each time. But if you start from 2 itself, you can obtain that series just by elevating it to a power and then changing the exponent. 
Let's do that. We sacrifice the ability to directly set the exact grid resolution we want and we replace it with 2 elevated to a power instead. As you can see, the grid is behaving as expected now. The higher the exponent, the more subdivisions we get. Next step is to animate these two, a thing that we can do in the very same way we did for the normalization value. So we want, let's say, three resolution steps, starting from level of subdivision 1, which is a 2 by 2 grid. Oh, and don't forget to keep the exponent as an integer value. Cool, now we can combine the grid scaling steps to the smooth offsetting of the distance fields. Since we need the offset animation value to go from 0 to 1 once for each resolution step, we can use the exponent fractional part to drive the movement. And there you go, now we are smoothly animating multiple resolution steps. Now we can try to use a map to drive the resolution scale, instead of a uniform value, to see how it behaves when it has to show different resolutions transitioning across the screen. Let's go for the same radial gradient we were testing with before. That definitely looks smoother. Not perfect yet with this continuous gradient, but it will definitely do the job when we'll use a pixelated input like we were doing in the full shader. This is basically the same problem we had at the beginning of the video showing up again in a different shape. Alright, I'd say it's time to upgrade our filter with these brand new features. Let's add function inputs for the resolution gradient, steps and minimum level of subdivisions. Let's copy over the new nodes and let's save some of their outputs to name it the root nodes. Ok, here's something we need to be careful about, the neighbor offsets. Before this we were just offsetting by one cell to get to a neighbor dot, now we can't do that anymore. Remember, adjacent cell dots are moving in opposite directions, so if we just offset by the size of the cell side, we don't land on a neighbor position anymore. Let's take in consideration a one-dimensional version of the problem to make it easier to grasp. Before we just needed a fixed step, but now let's say we're halfway through the dot converging animation. An offset of 1 would overshoot us by a lot, we need a shorter offset, and the opposite applies for the other neighbor. Looks like the amount of the offset needed scales depending on if the cell is on an uneven or an odd position and it does so by an amount proportional to the animation time. So let's start by adding a multiply node after our offset. Now we know that we need to scale it by two different numbers depending on the position of the cell, so let's add a linear interpolation that has the odd mask as alpha. Since now we are working on an horizontal offset, we take into account only the position along the x-axis. Ok, let's now understand by how much we should translate. Our dot is offset by transition time plus an offset of 1, which is our usual offset to reach the neighbor cell position. So if we subtract from our current offset the transition time once, we get to the neighbor unoffset position. But now our neighbor is also offset by the transition time towards our starting cell, so we subtract a second time the transition time to get to its current location. And we discover that we need an offset of 1 minus transition time. But what if we are in the other case where the neighbor is getting further? Well, we start with our offset of minus transition time, we add 1, we arrive short, we add transition time twice and we get to the neighbor location. It's essentially the same logic as before but with flipped signs, since the dots are being offset in the opposite directions. That was our positive x offset. For the next one, the negative x, we can copy everything but we swap the cases to obtain the opposite behavior. That's because if on one side the dot is getting closer to the neighbor dot, it automatically means that it is getting further from the one on the other side. Now for the vertical axis we can copy what we're doing along the horizontal one but we simply change the masked component of the odd cell mask to the g1. Alright, we should have it now, let's have a look. 
cool. I can't see anything obviously wrong, so I'd say it's a success. Now it's time to use this tag to build some nice features. The thing I was the most curious to try is the depth of field. Let's start from the scene depth. Now, to create the gradient we want, we first identify the focus distance. We can say the depth of field is composed of two gradients, one that goes from the focal distance towards the camera and one that goes from the focal distance away from the camera, which is double the size of the first one. So, I think I'll drive the length of the depth of field as a percentage of the focal distance. The first gradient will extend for a certain fraction of it and the second one will have double of that extension. Now we can combine them and add few tweaks here and there to create a nice falloff and prepare the gradient to be inputted in the material functions. Well, I'd say it's an interesting result. Probably it's not something I'd apply to a project just like this, but I think with a proper handling and blending with an unfiltered render, it could create a very cool outcome. As usual, you'll find a link to a sample project you can download in the video description. If you're a patron like these amazing guys, you'll also find a discount code. Now it's up to you to take this to the next level and create something original. For instance, who says that the pattern has to be composed of circular dots, or that the grid must be squared, or that the color components must be CMYK? If you get any cool ideas, share them in the comments or show them off in my Discord server. Otherwise, see you in the next video video.